today we will meditate on the uh, numbers yeah and also maybe the gates if we have time yeah when we open up uh, our bibles we will constantly find different numbers yeah like the number 40 the number 1 uh, the number 2 number 8 and we will constantly find numbers and usually numbers you know god speaks through uh, the things we see the the numbers the colors god uses these things to speak to us so usually numbers have a spiritual significance now we are not talking numerology we are talking from interpreting numbers from the bible yeah so our source of interpretation should always be scriptures never uh, the things of the world yep so th- the first thing we un- understand is numbers to have spiritual significance yep <clears throat> when whenever the number is used first in the bible yeah we need to un- uh, check that and immediately uh understand you see we need to see uh, understand is that uh, it will always be consistent the interpretation of the bible will always be all will always be consistent so if the numbers that we get the spiritual significance of the number is understood at one place uh, okay it will not change in another place it will always be consistent yeah god will never contradict his word he is always consistent yeah let's go straight into numbers the number 1 1 is usually symbolic of the number of god yeah uh, it it is also symbolic for beginning yeah it is also symbolic of first uh, symbolic of source yeah when we open up uh, to to uh, deuteronomy chapter 6 verse 4 yeah let's open there deuteronomy chapter 6 verse 4 it says there it says here o israel the lord our god is one so it's the number one is significant of god when you read john chapter 17 verse 21 to 23 jesus makes a prayer to the father and says you know he says there in john 17 21 to 23 it says there that they may be one as you father are in me you see so we see the number one is significant of god but it's also significant of the trinity three in one yeah it's three yet one so whenever we see the number one it is speaking about god it's always speaking about god the number two is significant for witness yeah witness or testimony when we open up our bibles to deuteronomy chapter 17 we will see there in deuteronomy 17 it says verse 6 it says whoever is deserving of death shall be put to death on the testimony of two or three witnesses two or three the number 2 is significant for witness we see in john chapter 8 john chapter 8 verse 17 and 18 it says that it is it is also written in your law that the testimony of two men is true i am one who bears witness of myself and the father who sent me bears witness of me the number 2 is significant for witness or testimony the number 3 is again symbolic of godhead okay we have three yet one it's symbolic of the godhead but it's also symbolic of of divine completion okay divine completion of perfect testimony yeah so when you read in 1 john chapter 5 verse 6 to 7 1 john chapter 5 verse 6 and 7 it says that this is he who came by water and blood jesus christ not only by water but by water and blood and it is the spirit who bears witness because it is the spirit because the spirit is truth verse seven for there are three that bear witnesses in heaven the father the word and the holy spirit and these three are one anybody questions the trinity i think this should un 
John clearly speaks about the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Yeah. In Matthew chapter 28, we see, we see there in Matthew chapter 28, it says, Matthew 28 verse 17, it reads, Go therefore and, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Again, we see three. Okay, the Trinity, the number three is speaking about the Godhead. Okay, it's also a number of completion. It's also of perfect testimony. The number four is symbolic for the, uh, the earth, the four corners of the earth. Yeah, uh, it speaks about the four different seasons that the world face, uh, sees. It has the different uh, four winds. Yep, you'll get that. You know, I'm, I will not go into every scripture, but you can check it out in the Bible. In Ezekiel chapter 37, verse 9, in Jeremiah 49, 36. Yeah, you can read it uh, out there. Yeah, so the number five is symbolic for grace. Yeah, number five. Yeah. <clears throat> and you see, uh, it's also symbolic of the cross. When you see Jesus, number five about the five wounds that he took upon him on the cross. See his hands, two hands, his both legs, the feet, and his side was pierced. Uh, his hands were pierced, two hands, his two feet were pierced, and we also know that his side was pierced. Speaking about the five wounds of Jesus, yeah, speaking about the cross, but at the same time also speaking about grace. That's why when we see that five loaves and two feet, yeah, the multiplication of the five loaves and two fish. I think when you understand five loaves speaks about grace and two speaks about witness. In unity, you will need to understand if inside the multiplication of five loaves. So, so five is the six, uh, six is the number of man. Okay, Genesis chapter 20, uh, sorry, Genesis chapter 1, verse 26 to 31. It says there, okay, then God said, Let us make man in our image according to our likeness. Let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, over the cattle, over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth, and subdue it and have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, over, the, over every living thing that moves on the earth. Then it goes further and God said, see, I have given you every herb that yields seed, which is on the face of the earth and every tree whose fruit yields seed. To you it shall be for food and also to every beast of the earth, to every bird of the air and to everything that creeps on the earth in which there is life. I have given every green herb for food and it was so. Then God saw everything that he had made and indeed it was very good. So evening and the morning were the sixth day. You see, sixth day God created man. Yeah, sixth day. So we see the number six is symbolic of man. But then there is six, 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 three times six. That is symbolic of the beast. That's the mark of the beast. Yeah. So number seven. Number seven speaks about the number of perfection or completion. Okay. It speaks about perfection or completion. In Genesis chapter two, verse one to three, we will see there. Thus the, thus the heavens and the earth and all the host of them were finished. And on the seventh day, God ended his work, which he had done. And he rested on the seventh day from all his work, which he had done. So the number seven is symbolic of completion. It was completed or it, it's also symbolic of perfection. The number eight, the number eight is symbolic of new beginnings. New beginnings. Yep. So uh, when you open to Genesis chapter 17, no need to turn there, but Genesis 17, we, we read of the circumcision, the covenant of circumcision that God uh, spoke to Abraham about. And it was on the eighth day, the 
eighth day that the child had to be circumcised speaking about something new that god was taking them into a new uh, bond with them uh, in 1 peter chapter 3 verse 20 we read of the eight people that was uh, that was saved uh, in uh, in the time of noah 1 peter chapter 3 verse 20 it says there who formerly were disobedient when once the divine long suffering waited in the days of noah while the ark was being prepared in which a few that is eight souls were saved through the water so when you look at the ark of noah noah's ark when you see that eight people were saved from there we see something new beginning for those eight people right this we see the the flood destroying everything but these eight moved into a new move or a new beginning the number eight is all the symbolic of new beginnings when we read in uh, matthew chapter 28 verse 1 matthew chapter 28 verse 1 it says there now after the sabbath has the first day of the week okay now the sabbath was the seventh day the first day of the week was what the eighth day so for the jewish people the sabbath was ending on saturday so the first day of the week would be saturday evening and sunday so what we see here is so what so what we see here is the eighth day jesus rose back from the dead a new beginning a new beginning so we need to understand whenever you get number 8 in your dreams or whenever god speaks about uh, gives you a number or tells you something uh, with with in in regards to the number 8 it's always symbolic of a new beginning number 9 is speaking about the fullness 3 into 3 makes 9 the number 3 is symbolic of what the godhead yeah so two times three three into three makes nine that means it's the fullness of the godhead but at the same time when you look at the number nine we will find in galatians chapter 5 verse 22 in galatians chapter 5 verse 22 we will see the nine fruits of the holy spirit in 1 corinthians chapter 12 verses 1 to 2 we will read the nine gifts of the holy spirit so the number nine usually speaks about also is the holy spirit okay so we see the fullness of god we see the holy spirit but also the number 9 also speaks about fruitfulness you see when you look about a pregnant woman pregnant carrying the seed for 9 months yeah after the 9th month we see the fruit so we see number 9 is also symbolic of fruitfulness number 10 okay number 10 usually refers to is either law the number of the law the number of order the number of the government yeah so when you or uh, when you read uh, exodus chapter 34 verse 28 yeah we see the 10 commandments are being given to moses when we read daniel chapter 2 we see god speaking about a new government order yeah a new a new rule coming forth we see in daniel 7 the 10 horns yeah about speaking about the new order that's going to come about the new nations that are going to rule so we see uh, the number 10 is, sig- is significant for law for order of a government restaurant the number 12 so the number 11 yeah also sorry the number 10 is also symbolic of responsibility if you remember the uh Mat- matthew chapter 25 verses 1 till 28 we read of the 10 virgins yeah five were responsible five were irresponsible La- lazy five were five had carried the extra oil the other five did not take the trouble so we see the number 10 is here speaking about responsibility the number 11 is an incomplete number it is one short of 10 i mean sorry one beyond 10 and one short of 
it's an incomplete number. It's speaking of something that is incomplete. The number 12 speaks about a divine government. You will see 12 apostles. You will see the 12 tribes. Yeah. When you open to the book of Genesis 49 verse 28, we will see there about the 12 tribes. We will see in the Revelations 12 as well. Okay, God speaking about the 12 apostles. We see, we see the 24 elders. Correct. So the number 12 speaks about a divine government. The number 13 is symbolic of the number of rebellion or backsliding. And you open up our Bibles to Genesis chapter 10 verse 9. And open there, Genesis chapter 10. Verse 9, it says there. <coughs> yeah, verse 9, it reads. Okay. He was a mighty hunter before the Lord. Therefore, it is said, like, Nim like Nimrod, the mighty hunter before the Lord. When you look at the word, the name Nimrod, Nimrod was 13th in line from Adam. Okay, he was 13th in line from Adam. And we know Nimrod was involved in the building of the Tower of Babel. Yeah, so he was a rebellion. He rebelled against the ways of God. Yep. <laughs> The number 40, very, I think we all will know this number. It's always speaking about testing. Jesus was in the wilderness, you know, was tested for 40 days. We see, G, uh, we see the Israelites in the wilderness for 40 years. We see Moses' years divided into three cycles of 40, 40, 40 each. You see, 40 is always symbolic of testing. The number 50 is symbolic of Pentecost or liberty. Yeah, Pentecost speaks about the uh, outpouring of the Holy Spirit. Yeah, speaks about the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. Okay, so now we go to the gate. Okay, so now we have got our foundations done. Okay, we've got the articles. We've got what silver stands for. Silver stands for redemption. Gold stands for divinity. Yeah, brass stands for judgment or strength to, strength to take the judgment. Then we have the blue color that represents heaven. We have the scarlet color that represents the blood, okay, the sacrifice. We have white linen that speaks about the righteousness of Christ. We've got uh, purple that speaks about the royalty of Christ. Okay, kingly. Yep. Yeah, so we've discussed all this in the previous class. Yeah, so today now we'll get into the gate. Now remember all these numbers and remember all these articles. Okay, they are, because it's just going to keep coming up again and again. Okay, now the gate of the court in Exodus chapter 27 verse 16, it is spoken of. Now when I'm speaking about the gate of the court, it is, I'm speaking about the outer court gate. Maybe if Chaitra has the clip of it, maybe you could just put the pic. Exodus chapter 27, verse 16. Okay. So when you see the gate, you see the you see the entire tabernacle, the outer court is surrounded by white cloth. Uh, it's white linen. Yeah, it is white linen. And right in the middle, you will see a kind of multiple colors. Okay. So that's the gate we are talking about right now. That's the gate. Now, when you look at this gate in Exodus chapter 27, keep it on there only so that we can uh, go back to it again. <clears throat> Exodus chapter 27 verse 16, it says there, For the gate of the outer court, there shall be a screen 20 cubits long. That means it was a very big gate, woven of blue, purple, scarlet thread, and fine woven linen. Made by a weaver, it shall be. It shall have four pillars and four sockets. So now we are seeing a gate of approximately twenty cubits long, broad. Okay. <clears throat> now one thing we need to understand is when anybody would walk around the tabernacle, not coming to the gate, 
Remember these words again. You walk around outside, from the outside. I'm not talking inside, talking from the outside. If you would walk around, you would only be seen is the white linen cloth. You don't want the gate. If you just walk around, you will only see the white linen cloth. That white linen cloth, if you remember the color white, was symbolic of the righteousness of Jesus Christ. So that white, so when people would see that white linen cloth, what it would tell them is, you keep out. Why? Because you are not worthy to come in. It would speak about a standard. It would speak about, about, about the righteousness that you need to live by. Well, as the gate, okay, was the only way that people could enter in. There was no other way that you could move in. Okay? There was, the gate was the only way to enter into the tabernacle. Okay, It was the one and only way to enter and all Israel or even strangers had to come the same way. There was only one way. There was no shortcut. There was no influence. You could not use anybody else. You could not use your position. You could not use your genealogy or oh, my, my father was Abraham or my father is a pastor or, uh, or, or, uh, or I, uh, my, my, my mother prayed. You can't use anybody else's. You have to come in through the gate. That was the only way in. Yeah? Whether you are an Israelite or whether you are a stranger, that was the only way in. Okay? <laughs> Any man who tried to enter another way would be called a thief. Do you recollect these words? If you, if you remember these words in John 10, verse 1 till 10, John chapter 10, verses 1 till 10. See what it says there. John 10, 1 to 10. Most assuredly, I say to you, he who does not enter the sheepfold by the door, but climbs up another way, the same is a thief and a robber. That means you try to get to God any other way, God doesn't accept you. You are illegally entering it. The only way you, you and I can legally enter into the presence of God is through that gate. Now we'll get to that gate again. Yep. So let's read John 10 further. In verse 2, But he who enters by the door is the shepherd of the sheep. To him the doorkeeper keeps... Uh, doorkeeper opens and the sheep hear his voice. He calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. And when he brings out his own sheep, he goes before them and the sheep follow him for they know his voice. Yet they will by no means follow a stranger but will flee from him for, do, for they do not know the voice of the stranger. And further in verse 7, Jesus said to them again, most assuredly, I say to you, I am the door of the sheep. I am the door of the sheep. All who ever came before me are thieves and robbers, but the sheep do not uh, hear them. I am the door. If anyone enters by me, he will be saved and will go in and out and find pasture. Isn't that clear? You enter, Jesus is saying, I am the door. You enter through me, you'll be saved. There's no other way. You see the tabernacle now, the outer court, it's speaking about only one door. There is no other way. And if you would go and stand in any other place, it would tell you you are not worthy. You cannot. You cannot enter in. You cannot keep that standard. No matter what you would do, you could not match up to the righteousness that God demanded. You see, God demanded a righteousness which you and I could not keep. Now we see Jesus opening the way for us. Not by our righteousness, by, but by the righteousness that he has kept. In John 14, verse 6, he says clearly there, John 14, verse 6. It says, <clears throat> Jesus said to him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. I am the way the truth and the life. No one can come to the Father except to me. I think Jesus is saying there is only one entrance. One entrance. One mediator between God and man. When you open to Acts chapter 4 verse 12, we will see that. It says <coughs> in Acts chapter 4 verse 12. Acts 
It reads there, nor is there salvation in any other, for there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. No one else. In 1 Timothy chapter 2 verse 4, it speaks there that we have one mediator, 2 verse 4. <clears throat> 1 Timothy chapter 2 verse 4, it says, for who, who desires all men to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth? For verse 5, for there is one God and one mediator between God and man, the man Christ Jesus. One God, one mediator, one access to go to God. That is Jesus Christ. Jesus says in John 16 verse, John 14 verse 6, I am the way, the truth, and the life. That means there's no other way. Another thing <clears throat> about this gate, if you put the gate picture again, if you will see from all the colors, the entire out, if you see, it's white. But the gate is colored different. You can put the, put the gate if you can, please, again. We see that gate multiple colors. You will see it purple. You will see it <coughs> white. You will see it scarlet. You will see it blue. Different colors. That means it is a beautiful gate. It's speaking about beauty. That you see, Jesus is is drawing us unto Himself. Yeah, He's drawing us unto Himself because He knows that with our work, with our strength, it cannot be possible. You see, anyone who draws people unto Him, unto Himself, will always fall short. But if anyone draws people unto the Lord, they will truly know what salvation is. Because salvation is in no other name but in Jesus. Now when you understand this gate also, we will see it is very unique. You can never mistake it. You cannot, you cannot, <coughs> uh, you know, uh, you cannot somehow miss it. You cannot miss it. You cannot miss it. You see, when what the world wants to uh, speak against Christianity, but whatever it may be, they still are after that one faith because there is something about it that they are drawn to. They are constantly, if you see from all religions of the world, the Christians are being persecuted the most, are targeted constantly, are constantly pulled down, are constantly being challenged because there's something distinctive, there's something unique, there's something different different that challenges everybody that challenges everyone yeah so when you stand outside and you see the gate it is something different it is not the normal because when you look up around that gate on the outside of the tabernacle it is gray dull dark meaningless dry land wilderness and here suddenly colors are there all around it's just striking it's just it's just so attractive so nobody can miss it. Nobody can miss it. So no matter where you run, that light, that color will definitely hit your eyes. Yep. Now when you see that the, the outer court, the gate, now you will see there is the outside, which is the wilderness, and the inside. There is the outside and the inside. You enter inside the tabernacle or inside you and uh, you go to the outer court, you will begin to see safety there. You will begin to see God beginning his work upon you. But if you stay outside the tabernacle or outside the outer court on the other side of the cut of, of the gate, there is the wilderness, there is danger, there is lack, there is emptiness, there is there is that is meaninglessness. So what, so what we see here is, it's only when you come to the gate and enter through that, that you will begin to get light. That's why Jesus speaks about, I am the door. Yeah, you, there's only one way to enter in. If you want to access, if you want access to the Father, there is only one way. So here we see uh, the outside and the inside. When you look into Noah's Ark, there was one door. And there was one door in Noah's Ark. And there was the outside, where there was death. And the inside, there was life, there was safety. Yep, the same way, when 
when, when we are inside the tabernacle and inside in, in the outer court, we will see ourselves saved. On the outside, we are lost. Okay. The gate gave us access to everything that was inside. So you enter through the gate, you will get that altar of sacrifice. Enter through the gate, you will get the brazen laver. You will get the holy place. You will get the holy of holies. Everything is there around in, once you enter the gate. You see, life is found inside Christ. Once you enter into a relationship with Christ, you will begin to get the benefits of what he has done. Come on. Come on. That's very powerful. Yeah. When you begin to enter into a relationship with Christ, you will begin to enter into every benefit that he has done on the cross for you and me. You will begin to, you will begin to uh, get enriched by everything that he has done for you. It is only when you enter. You cannot stand outside and enjoy the blessings of the inside. Yeah. So there are some who just, uh, just admire Christ from the outside. A good teacher, a good preacher, a, a man who lived with good principles. It's all on the outside. But to truly know life, you have to enter on the inside. We need to understand just admiring Christianity, just admiring Jesus, just speaking about his wonderful teachings, yeah, where he speaks, okay, if somebody slaps your one cheek, turn the other. If someone tells you go one mile, take two. You know, we so many, so many scholars or philosophers will use quotes from the scripture, but that does not mean that they're going to have life. To enter life, you have to enter in. Jesus. You have to enter in Christ. You have to have your own personal relationship with Christ. Yep. So here we see the gate gave access to everything, but you have to enter in to have access. Yep. Now, as we have said before, the fine, the, the, the fine twined linen, okay, uh, speaks about the righteousness of Christ. It also speaks about the gospel of John. I mean, Luke. And the blue speaks about the heavenly uh, place, uh, the heavenly one that is Jesus, yeah, which speaks about the gospel of John. Purple speaks about the royalty of Christ. It speaks about the gospel of Matthew. Scarlet speaks about the about about the sacrificial one that speaks about the gospel of Mark. So when you look into every color, every color is speaking about Christ, but it is also speaking that. Uh, if you if you take the colors to mean the gospels, yeah, we will also see that there were four pillars there that held this gate. So when you begin to see these four colors, four pillars that speak about the gospel, the number four, as I also said, speaks about the world. Yeah. So the gospel, the good news, is for the entire world, entire the all nations of any tribe, any tongue any language, any color, the gospel is for them. So it is, it, is, it is in Christ Jesus. It is all revealed in Christ Jesus. So what we understand is, <clears throat> so, what, so what we begin to understand is that when we begin to enter, to get that revelation of who Jesus is, we need to get to the word. It's not just head knowledge. We need to let the word of God get deep into us. We have to keep reading the Bible. The word of God begins to get our life. It begins to draw to a relationship with him. Yeah. Now we see that the gate was 20 cubits wide in length. 20 cubits. That's a very big gate. 20 cubits would come to approximately, approximately 30 to 40 feet 30 to 40 feet, that's quite a big, quite a big gate. Yeah, quite a big gate. See, one, one cubit was approximately one and a half feet. Yeah, approximately one and a half feet. So 20 cubits would become 20 feet plus another 10. It is approximately 30 feet, a big gate, right? I don't think we ever make such big gates. What does that tell you and me? It tells me that salvation is for everybody. It's an open door. Open door. 
but the time will come when the door will be shut yeah right now even now in this present age it's an open door god has opened the door through christ for all nations isn't that amazing through christ god has opened up the door for all nations the day will come when that door will be shut so that's why the urgency to preach the gospel yeah so it was 20 cubits in length and it was 5 cubits high so 5 cubits high would make it around 7 seven and a half feet plus minus maybe even more <clears throat> seven and a half feet high that means seven around seven and a half feet it would be difficult for an average height person right an average height person was six feet yeah uh, maybe sorry an average height person would be five 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 eight yeah a tall person would be six feet and above so it would be difficult to see through you had to see there is no shortcut to seeing what's inside you have to enter through christ to get a glimpse of heaven it's only through jesus yep another thing we'll see is <coughs> it was 20 so it is 20 cubits wide 5 cubits high when you multiply 20 into 5 comes to 100 cubits now the 100 the, the number 100 always speaks about 100% give it to you all give it your all <clears throat> so that means what god is saying is if you want to enter into my presence i require a 100% commitment from you i want you to go come in all all in come all in with all your heart give me your all but when you look into our lives we don't give 100% right we struggle to give that 100% so year year we see God is saying hundred percent. Now, who gave us His hundred percent? It is Jesus. You see, through the cross of Jesus, through the life of Christ, the veil has been opened. The access has been made for us. So we have direct entry into the very presence of God. Now, as I spoke to you about the pillars in Exodus chapter thirty-eight, verse nineteen. Yeah, <clears throat> I think we are done with the gate chair. So we can take it off. Exodus chapter thirty-eight, verse nineteen. It says, "Yeah, <clears throat> and there were four pillars with their four sockets of bronze. Their hooks were silver, and the overlay of their capitals and their bands was silver. All the pegs of the tabernacle and the court all around were bronze." Now we are going to get deeper into this later on. Yeah, we are going to get <clears throat> deeper into the pillars on the bronze socket and the silver. Uh, we are going to get into it deeper <clears throat> but the important thing is it had four pillars it speaks about all nations now one thing we see is we are talking about the about, about the gate that was there from the wilderness to enter into the outer court but there was another entrance which was called a door that door would take you from the outer court to the holy place then we have the veil which was from the holy place to the holy of holies okay now when you look into this revelation of john 14 verse 6 it says i am the way the truth and the life the gate speaks about the way so we enter so so when jesus was speaking these words the the jewish people knew what he meant isn't it amazing yeah but for us in this generation we will find it difficult what does it mean but when the jews heard him say this they knew that the that the gate was called the way the door was called the truth and the uh, way to the holy of holies was called life so when jesus is saying i am the way the truth and the life what he's speaking of is i am the way to to for you to be saved i am the truth that will bring about revelation and i am life that why because i i i, I am the tabernacle of the father i am the dwelling place you know i am the one who carries the presence of god so we see in the tabernacle the scripture makes more sense the way the truth the life we are going to get more into that detail there yeah? because the 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 outer court dealt with sacrifice and cleansing yeah the 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 labor would was used for cleansing so the outer court was speaking about the way how can i get in how can i get into the way is when i get washed by the blood and i am washed by the word remember jesus speaking about the word washing us yep so <clears throat> he says the blood washes us the word washes us then 
if I want to get into the holy place, I, I need to have the truth. How do I receive the truth? It's the spirit of God, the revelation of God uh, that comes forth only through the Holy Spirit. So it's the spirit of God that gives us revelation. It's the spirit of God that gives us insight into the word of God. And from there, how can I enjoy life is when I move in through that from the holy of from the holy place to the holy of holies, where we will see the 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 tablet. Okay, we will see the rod of Aaron that budded, and we will see also the mana. Okay, that all speaks about about uh, about the heart of God. It speaks about the of God. It speaks about the provisions of God. So everything we can experience is in Christ. He says, I am the way, I am the truth, I am the life, I am the provision of God. I am the standard of God. I am the heart of God. It's all found in Christ. Yeah. So I pray that as you begin to get deeper and deeper, you will begin to understand that the heart of God is found in Jesus. As you and I begin to deep, dig deeper and deeper in God, in Christ, we will begin to understand his ways are simple. Let's not complicate it. You know, as I always say, let's not complicate our walk with God. Be Christ and Christ-centered alone. Nothing else matters. No one else matters. Being Christ and Christ-centered alone. You know, to be good, it's not possible. But with Christ, it's possible. To be a giver, it's not possible. But with Christ, it's possible. To love, it's not possible. But with Christ, it's possible. So our center should always be in Christ. I come to pray is to get deeper in Jesus. Amen. Shall we just pray? Father, I just thank you for this time. I pray, Father, that you would truly take us deep, Father. Thank you for Jesus. Thank you that through his blood that was shed, through his, through his death on the cross, that the blood that was shed, we have got access into the into your very presence. We thank you that through Jesus today we have life. And help us, Father, that we would always be focused on the finished work of, J of Jesus rather than focusing on ourselves. Because at the end of it all, it's all about Jesus and Jesus alone. Holy Spirit, I pray, touch everyone watching. Let them experience you. Let them draw near to you. I give you all the praise, Father God. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen, amen, amen. Yep, for all those who will be watching us on YouTube, if you're blessed, don't forget to be a blessing. Don't forget to share the video. Let others too grow in the word. And uh, if you want to be a partner of our big ministries, all you need to do is hear from God and obey his word. Yeah, that's all. Because obedience is what brings blessings. Yep, so don't forget to join us again, same time next week. God bless you. Bye-bye.